Sister Mary Lee, I want to thank you and the Holy Spirit uh, for your choice and special music today. I, I really personally very much feel both the need of being raised up by God as well as the power of that promise from God. So I want to thank you for that choice on our behalf. As we get started with our uh, sermon for today, uh, I want to name that during the season of Epiphany, we will be uh, having a series of sermons on the compelling vision statement passed uh, by the Church of the Brethren Annual Conference uh, this past summer, and the scriptures that undergird uh, that statement. And so as we get started here, I'd just like to read the statement printed in your bulletin for you. Together as the Church of the Brethren, we will passionately live and share the radical transformation and holistic peace of Jesus Christ through relationship-based neighborhood engagement. To move forward, we will develop a culture of calling and equipping disciples who are innovative, adaptive, adaptable, and fearless. I invite you to pray with me. Loving God, you challenge us consistently through the words of Scripture and through the witness of your people, the Church. Help us as we wrestle both with the Scriptures and the discerned vision of our denomination. To be challenged to be more than we thought we could be. And also to be raised up by the power of your promises. Go with us as you continue to reveal yourself to us. These things we pray through Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Teacher, and our Lord. Amen. As we enter this season of Epiphany, a season that honors the revealing of Jesus the Christ in the early stages of His earthly ministry, we will be turning our attention to the compelling vision statement passed by the Church of the Brethren Annual Conference, meeting online last summer. On the one hand, it may seem a little bit audacious to call a vision statement compelling, when, even when it is in the process of being discerned. I certainly believe it is appropriate to hope and to pray that this vision reminds us of our shared commitments to Jesus Christ, draws us together both within the local congregation and within the Church of the Brethren as a whole, and leads us to a renewed focus on the mission church. But as with all visions, both those stated formally and those that emerge organically, I personally believe the proof is in the pudding. We will find out in the years ahead as we seek to live out the vision that we believe God has called us to be about, exactly how compelling it is. I believe that one of the most difficult things about vision, within the life of any organization, is a recognition that vision is but a first step. Without vision, it is impossible to get anywhere. But having a clear and unifying vision that you have put to paper is not a guarantee that one will ever get to the place where that vision leads. There remains the hard work of discerning exactly where God is leading us in each of the smaller tasks that give marrow and muscle, structure and witness to making that vision into a lived reality. And so as we turn to this series of sermons focused on the compelling vision statement of our denomination, I ask two things from our congregation. First, I ask that we keep an open mind. There will be parts of our engagement with what God is calling us to do through this vision statement that seem very familiar, places where our local discernment may have preceded the discernment of the larger body of Christ. There will be other places 
where this vision will challenge us to look beyond the comfortable and familiar and trust that the God who has led us to the point we are at now will indeed lead us into a future that only He can prepare for us and lead us into. The second thing that I ask is that we, with God's help, seek to live out this shared discernment of the larger church. While there will be parts of the whole church, of what the whole church is doing, that might not be our niche as a local congregation, that does not mean that God is not calling the denomination to those things. We are part of a larger whole, and I believe that the vision that is, is before us is at its best when we seek with God's help to lift up the aspirational calling that God has placed before us. Each of the next eight Sundays, we will be focusing on a phrase or idea from this compelling vision statement and the biblical basis that is behind that phrase or idea as we seek God's leading for our congregation. One of the most basic Christian commitments that we emphasize in the Church of the Brethren is the importance of community. While we preach and teach that each person as an individual must decide for her or himself whether to follow Jesus, we also preach and teach and believe it is undergirded in the Scripture that the very moment that we decide to follow Jesus, we have decided that we will join with others who have also heard the call of our Lord Jesus and accepted it. We might decide to follow Jesus alone, but in deciding to follow Jesus, we are brought into a family that is bound together by the same covenant promises that we have made. Together, as the Church of the Brethren, we renew our commitment to following Jesus. And while it may seem self-evident to many of us that we follow Jesus in community, the value of togetherness cannot be taken for granted in this time and in our society. We live in a culture that increasingly begins by asking of just about anything, what's in it for me? and seeks to evaluate the righteousness or correctness of a given program or idea by how that idea or program fits with the needs, wants, and desires of the individual doing the evaluation. In writing to the, to the early church, the Apostle Peter took on this idea of sacred togetherness. He wrote to the new believers, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you might proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. This rich verse, I believe, leads to two very important conclusions. The first conclusion is about togetherness. The word that is translated as you is better translated into Southern English as y'all. It is a second person plural form of the word you. The original Greek that Peter wrote in indicates that it is not a collection of individuals who are called. It is a cohesive group formed together by the calling of the Lord our God in Jesus Christ. Y'all are a chosen race. Y'all are a royal priesthood. Y'all are a holy nation. Y'all are God's own people. The y'all in question refers to the church of our Lord, Jesus the Christ, those who are called out of sin and into newness of life by our shared confession that Jesus is our Lord and our Savior. When we make that confession, we are bound together, not by our shared blood ties, although some of us have them. When we make that confession, we are, not, we are bound together not because of our shared social interests, although some of us have those. 
We are bound together not based on the same nationality, the same social class, our economic attainment, or our racial identity. We are bound together first and foremost by this shared confession that Jesus the Christ is our Savior and our Lord, that each of us had made and had sealed in our baptism, proclaiming our commitment first and foremost above all else to follow Jesus. Our togetherness, therefore, is found in Christ Jesus and in our shared commitment to follow where he leads. We are together as God's people, not because of anything that we have done, but because of what God has first done for us in Christ. Second, we are called together and set apart for a purpose. We are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, not because we are somehow existentially better than others, but so that we can proclaim the mighty acts of the one who has called us. The God who gives us identity also gives us mission. Our togetherness, in the local church, in the denomination, and in the church universal, has a purpose. Its purpose is to testify to the power of God in Jesus Christ. Both our existence and our message testify to that power. The fact that we come together at all testifies to the way that God compels us in Christ Jesus and brings us together. It speaks to the power of God to make a people where previously a people had not been. Whenever and wherever we come together as God's people, whether it's here in this building on Sunday morning, together with the other churches in our district at Camp Bethel, Awakening, Project Warm District Conference, and the many other ministries we share together, together with the other churches in our denomination, at annual conference, national youth conference, or on disaster response, or together with the churches of other denominations, as we do through the Southeast Road of Christian Partnership, we come together for this purpose of bearing witness to the one who calls us out of sin and into newness of life. This, sisters and brothers, is a different type of togetherness. One that has its foundation not in personal or group satisfaction of those who are coming together, but rather has its foundation in this shared sense of mission. We are together because of who we are in Jesus and because of what God has called us to do because of Jesus. God calls us together with this purpose in mind. The Apostle Peter continues by urging us as aliens and exiles in this world to abstain from the desires of the flesh that wage war against the soul. In this way, the togetherness of the church stands apart from the rest of the world. The church is called for a purpose and is expected to live according to that purpose. Part of our togetherness as God's people is giving encouragement to one another as we seek to live by the values and expectations of God in a world that so frequently opposes those values. But it goes even deeper than that. Togetherness in and of itself is a countercultural value. The idea that individuals should, even occasionally, yield our own desires to the common good run smack dab into the idea that freedom means that nothing will contain the autonomous individual. In a society that increasingly understands and believes that individual autonomy and self-fulfillment is the highest moral good, the call to follow Jesus together sets us apart because it proclaims that yieldedness to God and to one another in Christ Jesus is more important than our personal desires. Before we get to anything else 
that God is calling us to do as a result of our shared vision as the church. We, as the Church of the Brethren, unapologetically claim and proclaim that we are called to follow Jesus together. In a world of increasing individualism, where the first question often asked is, what's in it for me? We claim and proclaim that God has called us to be together as the Church of the Brethren under the banner of Jesus Christ. As I ponder this call, I wonder if one of the great struggles of togetherness is that so many of us have assumed that togetherness is the natural order of things. Something that might happen even almost by accident. What once may have been the natural order of things, we must now preach and teach as a positive good. What we might, what might have once assumed, God is calling us to make explicit. Our shared commitment to Jesus Christ binds us together and asks us to move in the same direction. Most of us were nurtured into the Christian faith with the assumption that when we chose to follow Jesus, we necessarily chose not only union with Christ, but also union with others who have also chosen to follow Jesus. While this assumption is going the way of the buffalo, the value of togetherness, as God's people is more important than ever. It's just that we can't assume that people will pick it up through osmosis. We must preach and teach the importance of following Jesus together. Because when we follow Jesus together, we testify that our shared mission of proclaiming the deeds of the one who brought us out of sin and into newness of life is more important than our individual preferences. When we follow Jesus together, we, have to, we testify that we have come to view one another the way that God views each and every one of us. At the end of the annual conference last year, our current moderator, Brother David Sollenberger, expressed this sense of togetherness best when he said in announcing the theme for next summer's annual conference, that if we, brothers and sisters, want to be Jesus in the neighborhood, perhaps we ought to first start by trying to be Jesus to one another. Or to put it another way, John the Elder put it in his first letter. Those who say, I love God and hate their brothers or sisters or are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen, cannot love the God that they have not seen. We commit to following Jesus together and expressing the love of God to one another as a sign of our shared purpose in testifying to the works of the God who has called us together. And in affirming that commitment to following Jesus together, we believe that the very act of being together as God's people testifies to the power of God and expresses God's love, not only to those who are already gathered here, but to those who will experience God through our mission and ministry. May we, with God's help, seek, out to live, seek to live out that commitment to follow Jesus together in all that we say and in all that we do. Amen. As we now respond to what God continues to do in our midst, let us join together in singing hymn number 362, Help Us to Help Each Other. 